Hello people! Welcome to another edition of Dose of Drew and tonight we're doing Sunday Sharpings or I guess today depending on when this goes out and this one's going to be a short introduction as we're talking about edges because we're this is going to be the first in a series of sharpening videos um, so we want I want to talk about the different bevels and edges and just to get a few just for anyone who knows this is actually a 30 degree angle it's 15 degrees per side so there's actually some accuracy to this but I want to talk about the different grinds. First, we have the flat. This is just a straight grind. Um, if you want to think about back in the day, they used to have things like flat stones, grinding stones, all that stuff. This is, this is the flat side. This is a concave or hollow grind. I have the dotted lines to uh, mimic the flat grind. So it's inset. It's, it's, it's uh, hollowed out from the flat grind. Um, this is usually done with wheels. Right, so you have like a large diameter wheel that's grinding and, or you have two set wheels, something like that. This is called a convex grind or parabolic or hyperbolic, but it goes out from the 30 degree lines there, the dotted lines there. And this, this one goes, has more mass to it. And this is usually done historically by hand on, a, on taking advantage of the normal arc of the hand or with belts or, or some other sort of flexible type of grinding. Let's talk about what the what this is. This is both primary, secondary, bevel. You can do both of these. The old school, you had what would be a giant donut with a tight hole. Giant donut with a small hole is also just coincidentally the name I gave my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Uh, so just to give you an idea, on this type of thing, the large, you may have seen it in cartoons, large spinning wheel. You know, if someone's pushing it with their foot or something, and they're grinding something on it. Um, if you grind around the circumference, you'll get this hollow grind. Even if it's a really huge grind and your grind is a tiny bit, it's just slightly hollow grind. Uh, other systems like a Tormek or something like that will give you a very slight hollow grind or a concave grind as opposed to flat. If you grind on the outside of this torus or donut, like if, if you're grinding on the flat side or if it's laying flat, like it, like if instead of up like in the cartoon so that the edge, you know, it's like that wide and like that tall. But if it's set flat, like on a pottery wheel or on a pottery stand, you get this whole uh, flat surface that you can use to grind flats. And today, this is where you get, you know, you get your stones and all that sort of stuff that are flat. You're grinding a flat surface. The edge two surface, two round surfaces come together. I'm not going to do the rest of that. Um, come together into one point. So that's, that's why you can get this incredibly narrow and sharpness on that. And then you have the convex grind. And we'll get to more how to do this by hand in further videos. But this is usually what you see on something that's got... You know, where you'll have like a, a belt set up or something like that. So you have this belt that's traveling through there and the belt has flex. Right, so you can flex that belt in and, the, and it grinds a curve. That's going to grind something, grind something that's more like a hyper, hyper, hyperbola instead of a para, parabola. Which, in my opinion, you want the, par, the parabolic one, but the hyperbolic one isn't that much different. I'm not going to get into that much math, but we'll get it. But that's this is where I want to go, and I want to talk about the two different because most of the time when you're when you're grinding by hand nowadays, you're making a flat uh, bevel, secondary bevel or whatnot. When you grind it through, it's flat. Couple of things about this: this long narrow bit of the hollow grind tends to make the geometry. Right? For, for, so, so for the same width up here behind the edge to here, see how it goes in from that 15 degrees? It becomes, you know, this angle right here is actually less than, theta is actually less than 30 degrees. Right? Um, and if you look at here on the convex, this dotted line is the, third, is the 15 degree per side. And so you'll see that theta, or this angle right here, is actually greater than 30 degrees. Right? And so this one right here is actually equal to 30 degrees. This is going to get more important later, but I want to talk about it in that when you talk about sharpness, a lot of what you're talking about is how nicely it's apexed or how sharp this point is 
right, at the event. And then when you start looking at testers, it's how well this shape works at passing through material, right? So these things all do, when you're passing through material, whenever you do a sharpness test, part of what you're testing is how well the shape or geometry moves material. If you've ever cut paper, you'll notice how it curves away. In fact, I can give an example while I speak of it. You may even notice that it tends to curve, right? And you can even see how it curves up there. That's the it moving. This this paper doesn't just get cut; it has to split, right? It has to split and move out of the way. So it tends to roll towards me, all that sort of stuff. Um, for those of you who don't know, we'll talk about burrs and that sort of stuff. That's a paper burr right there. Anyway. But yeah, so you're you're all sharpness testers, a best tester, anything like that. Part of it's going it's always going to be geometry because there's a thickness to that wire, and what you cut through, you have to move out of the way. So that for those of you who know math, we'll talk about that real quick. On the straight, right? On the straight bit, you have you have your material here. When it gets starts coming into the little wire, it makes a little notch, right? It has to push the rest of this material out of the way in order to cut further down. And so this is resisting it. There's, there's a force coming down, and there's a force that's pushing it out of the way. And this actually makes the triangle. Um, if you wanna, <laughs> if, if you look at it, if you look at it where it comes, you know, it comes down here and all that sort of stuff, this angle is going to be the same as this one. But there's forces working on it. So part of it is the force you're pushing down is actually driving this down. The other part of the force of you're pushing down is driving it away. The narrower you can get this part that's cutting through so that it actually moves it out of the way, the, small, or the smaller this angle is, the more force that's going to be pushing down and not out so it or, or essentially more that splits it and less that actually moves the wire out of the way the wider you get it more of it, all the way to a 45 degree angle right if, you know if this was a 45 degree angle um anything coming off here right, is split evenly between the down force and that force so 22 and a half degree is going to split the down and sideways equally. That's, that's an interesting little bit, but it, it really does. So you, the narrower you get it, you get more down force and it will register better on a best. Um, the downside to the, to the, so that's it's constant on a flat. The downside of that is some of the stress follows it in an in a arc like that. So you have the stress area in here and it can actually run out past, and that's, when that happens, you get chips and stuff. Same can happen here, but here's your problem, and the dotted lines kind of already show it. Once you've gotten a material, all the, starts getting up closer to where that hollow grind ends, it gets, it's not, it's not narrower anymore. This is a massively greater angle, so you get, it's really, really easy to slice here, but as you get closer to the, that uh, top of that concavity, it's much more difficult to keep pushing through without actually just really, just, you're pushing stuff out of the way instead of down. On softer materials, this can actually create a thing where uh, if you have a hollow grind like this and you have something like cheese or meat where it cuts it through and then it catches this, you can actually get air in between there and it keeps it from sticking. This is like Granton edges and stuff like that. So it does work nice for soft materials. And then the par parabolic, convex, or hyperbolic, whichever you want to look at, the convex, we'll talk about it for now, actually put here, it's putting a lot more, uh, since the angle is wider, it's putting a lot more on separating it, but as you get out, it moves through. This is actually the most efficient shape for cleaving through and pushing material out. It's why things like rockets and such have that classic shape, as they move the air out of the way. They pierce the air uh, and other stuff most efficiently you, being able to utilize 
the most amount of uh, energy to go forward while still getting stuff out of the way most efficiently. So that's the three different types of edge. We're not going to spend too much time on the hollow grind by hand because uh, on a lot of the stuff, it's going to be mostly about hand sharpening as well as some different types. We'll go over some different types of sharpeners and all that sort of stuff. But it's really going to be more about how you can do it at home by hand if you end up getting a power sharpener and so on and so forth. Um, things like this flat side tend to be pull through sharpeners, right? Pull through. Um, any any uh, like bench stones, right? That's generally speaking, if you only grind once you're, or if you do a standard, nowadays standard, uh, techniques, you'll get this flat grind. This, and just about anything else, uh, oh, uh, lever arm, right? So <coughs> your KMEs, your workshops and stuff like that. And a lot of those all have, everything has its pros and cons. This is almost entirely by a wheel system, right? The wheel is almost entirely for the, for the hollow. Oops, hollow, flat. And now on the convex, this is almost entirely by belts and by hand. And there's several ways to do it by hand. There, I mean, there's a whole video coming on how to do that. Um, if you know anything about parabolas and their math, it will be a lot easier. I'll go through it in there. But the belt is tends to be, because it flexes, it makes sort of a curve like that. You can also look at this as like two circles that overlap, and that's a terrible, terrible. I'm not even gonna play that game no more with my racer. We'll do a partial here. I'll use a stencil. <laughs> but you have things where it can just literally be overlapping circles. And like just this bottom part right here is is the edge. It's not exactly a parabola, but unless you start looking at microscopic, there's all sorts of things about apex. But we'll get through that. So those are the different types of of bevels. And for those of you who don't know where the two angles come together, it's called the apex. It is the apex of whether it be for an angle, it is where the curve or the point is. Apex, apex, uh, if you have a curve, um, where that is the most, right, where it's tangential, that's also the apex. So we'll, there's, there's lots of, without getting too pedantic about definitions, we'll just say that the apex is where it is. And a well apex means a narrow apex. You want those things to come together in as small an area as possible so you concentrate force on that area. So a well apexed edge is one that has a very, very narrow, you want to get into like a molecular, like if you go to like obsidian or other sorts of glasses, you can get into monatomic apexes or monatomic edges where those, these edges are down to a single atom. For things that aren't monatomic, they're going to be sharp depending upon your resolution, but in the end, they're also going to be slightly rounded as they're rounded towards like molecular shapes and stuff like that. So depending upon the scale, it's always relative for those of you who know physics, that's, that is that. So this is the first getting to know a lot of this may not sense, but it really is the first start in, in, in the sharpening things because most of what we're going to be talking about is going to be the, when you look at techniques and such, is going to be the flat. As that's most of what you see nowadays in the at home stuff. There's some like Tormex and some others that have wheels. And there's even some that have belts. Like there, there's some work sharp ones as well as just, you know, regular large belts. They just have essentially this a belt drive that allows you to have a small convex edge. And how to do a hand convex edge, both 
with the arc and how to set it up when you're grinding it so that you have the right sort of angles to make a really, really good convex bevel, as well as um, essentially anything that's spongy as well. Anything that's like, this is gonna be spongy. Uh, uh, and let me see if I have it right here. I know where it is. And by spongy, I mean something like Trizac sandpaper that has this sort of foam squishiness to it that gives you a level of resistance that's fairly constant, though it's kind of like a spring. It gets a little bit, little bit tougher the more you squeeze it, but it's a fairly constant amount of squish or resistance that allows you to get a bit of convex uh, thing, much like how a belt bends around with a sort of amount of stretchiness. It can only stretch so far. So as it starts to stretch further away, it gets harder to stretch away from the flat. This has a similar uh, property. So just to recap there, flat, concave, or hollow, convex, or parabolic, hyperbolic, or all that sort of thing. Um, these are all the kind of things that you, you can call them. It used to be you had things like grinding wheels and grinding stones. And that's how you got these edges. It's also why having a large stone that you can grind, there was a, a lot of hollow grinds as well as flat grinds for a long time were very, very common where the convex was less so except for in places like Asia or Japan specifically where they had a history of convex edges. Um, but yeah, grinding wheels and that sort of stuff definitely give you these, the big flat Gives you flat edges as well as a lot of other grinding things when you have a nice big torus, or as I said, uh, a large donut with a small hole. Again, one of my ex-girlfriend's nicknames. Um, <laughs> had to do that joke twice. But yeah, so that's where we're going. I'm going to leave it off on this one is just the edge types, where we're going to go with this so you can take a look at it, get used to it. I'll be using these terms and I'll be referencing this stuff later on, especially as um, lever arm and bench. Don't, I don't use pull throughs, so we're only going to talk about those. I don't use the wheels, so we're only going to talk about those on any hollow grinds I have to show. And then the convex where uh, I may be able to get some belt action in to show. We'll see um, how I can set up that video. And of course by hand, which is something I can most definitely do. So a lot of the bench stone lever arm and the convex by hand is already something we get. We'll see if we can get a belt. Though, you, everyone watching this may be better served to just go watch a lot of the knife makers where they show them doing it by belt, even with a platen. It still gives it a little bit of a convexness. So there may be some other places I go to show that. We'll also be talking about how things cut and how you get burrs and why even on something that's cutting over get burrs for those of you who don't know the channel not affiliated this has nothing to do with it there is a channel called breaking taps that is absolutely fantastic does all sorts of wonderful photography on and how to do it they even have one where they show a cutter um chewing out aluminum um where you can see the stress you know this would be the aluminum and this is where it's piling up but you can see like the where it's cutting through and you can see the stuff piling up. You can see stress lines. We'll talk about that and why, why that causes burrs going into some of the theory. There'll be a couple of videos on theory and hopefully by that time we'll have figured out how to get the bench stone lever room and all of that sort of photography, uh, videography and that sort of stuff done as it's really not my forte. That being said, everybody, we're, I'm going to go ahead and start to wrap this up here. Again, flat, concave or hollow, and convex or bulbous. <laughs> um, and, and really just kind of the stuff we're going to go. So there you go. I'm going to, I'm going to take out this video. So you go ahead and take this video. Uh, watch it twice. Comment as much as you like. Be mindful of side effects. Remember to like and subscribe. This has been your Dose of Drew. I am said Drew. You guys have a great rest of your night.